Thank you, Becky. I'll just ask, uh, are you hearing me all right? Okay. Coming to you from the Mountain Cloud Doksan room in our new hometown, Santa Fe. So welcome again, everyone, to this July Zazenkai at Mountain Cloud, a day of practice following on our summer session just a few weeks ago. Also want to welcome anyone who may be joining in from the 30 Days of Zen program, which is now making the turn today Day 16, how fitting to bring the momentum of daily sitting into the deep pool of this day's shared practice. So welcome. For the last six months of Zazen Kai, we've been looking at women in Zen not women as opposed to men or supplanting men, but women intimately interwoven in the long line of ancestors whose teaching comes down to us right here, right now. It's always here always now. Women named and unnamed who are part of what the tradition calls the storehouse of the Dharma. The theme for our recent session was intimacy with all things. That's Dogen's definition of awakening, intimacy. Another name for the storehouse, that which you are, that which we embody and express in our practice, even as we seek to see it and clarify it. So before the retreat started, I glanced quickly at a long list of women ancestors whose names are now recited in some Zendos, particularly in the West. And I saw Zhangsha, an obvious choice. Thought I'd <clears throat> better have a name to give to Johanna before the session started. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Zangsha is one of four disciples and Dharma heirs of Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma, the founder of Zen or Chan in China, famously made that treacherous journey as a very old man to come and meet Emperor Wu. Sangshi's biography is well recorded. What hadn't quite sunk in when I chose her for today is that not a word of her teaching survives. Sangshi's story includes one line, her response to Bodhidharma when he asks his students to convey their understanding. What have you realized? What have you received? How will you present the world you see, the real world, this great intimacy. He's about to die 
and the time has come. I wish we could hear more from Zangsha, but her one line is enough. That and the wider web of her story. It's all about intimacy. So a little background. Zangsha, also known by her title, Soji, and by her nun's name, Mioran, was the daughter of an emperor of the Liang dynasty in the sixth century China. Uh, some records identify her father as Emperor Wu, which is quite enticing because of this meeting with Bodhidharma and Emperor Wu. But it turns out there are a number of Emperor Wu's in this you know, sort of these centuries of China's history. And there's also a very famous Empress Wu, who was probably about a century later, maybe 700s, I'm not sure. Um, so there is some story here. Uh, you know, for a long time, Bodhidharma was thought to have been a legendary figure or a composite figure. And, now that's come around where there's more evidence, new scrolls have been found. And it's thought that he lived and you could point to uh, sixth century. Um, so we're, I mean, it doesn't really matter, does it? And yet there's something so alive, palpable right now. Zongxi's father, this Emperor Wu, converted to Buddhism when he took the throne. He was an avid supporter of monks and nuns and a serious student of Buddhism himself. So there were festivals and lectures and debates in the palace and near the imperial grounds and this child, Zongshi, grew up sort of watching and listening and taking all of this in. And somehow, as a young woman coming of age much more early than uh, we do in our culture, somehow she avoided being married off as a wife or a concubine. And when she was 19, she asked her parents permission to ordain and become a nun. Um, her mother was very excited for her, uh, begged her father and the father of course, with all of these ties could only agree. So off song she went. Um, she entered a convent and a context that would have reflected the privilege of her standing. It's a little strange to say because women, even royalty, had almost no rights whatsoever in this culture. And yet when she left the palace walls, the convent that she went to was for noble women uh, and such. And so it had a, a rarefied quality to the life there. And um, for her, that was a, uh, she was disillusioned. I was appreciating that word as I came across it. She got over her illusions and left. Song she left and maybe without knowing it, she retraced the footsteps of Bodhidharma, who met with Emperor Wu. I think they were both disappointed. And Dharma leaves, crosses the Yangtze River, crosses into the Northern Kingdom, goes to this holy city, depending on the story, 
um, and finally to Shaolin Temple or a cave right there. So Zhang Shi leaves, crosses the river, crosses the border between kingdoms, and she goes to the Buddhist city of Luoyang. Several accounts indicate that it was there that she found Bodhidharma teaching under a tree with his few male disciples sitting around him. I can imagine that it might have been few because he was such a daunting figure. A, a real renegade and uh, you can you can see an image of him actually on the sort of iconic image of Bodhidharma on the scroll behind me. Oh. So he's there teaching with these monks. And Song she sees him and just walks into their midst and sits down apparently without any objection from Bodhidharma. Actually, not only without objection, in sixth century China, monks were strictly forbidden to keep company with women. In society at large, men and women didn't mix, didn't live together and could be punished we're doing that. A uh, woman's stature is far and forever below that of men was sort of, you know, a key part of the Confucian order. That was the order of the day, just instantiated in culture. Zhangxi would have traveled with Bodhidharma and stayed with the monks on the way to Shaolin Temple. So either he defended her presence or no one dared to challenge him. It's possible that imposing figure is called the Western Barbarian. Bodhidharma's acceptance of a woman disciple embodies the equality and equanimity of the Dharma. If he knew, we don't know, if he knew she was the emperor's daughter, there's no indication. It wouldn't have mattered. And Songshi's willingness to follow her heart, to walk right in where she sensed the Dharma. What a profound expression of courage. Courage, a key aspect, quality of this practice, this way of the heart, this way of fearless humility. Yamada Komoroshi quotes a saying um, in his book, uh, Zen, the Authentic Gate. Many of you have read the saying is, being of reckless courage can accomplish Buddhahood in a flash. Reckless courage. to gaze at the wall completely undefended, to gaze directly at the wall, even with the gaze lowered, to see the wall looking back at you, maybe to sense the relationship or 
the interdependence, to sense the thousand foot cliff of the wall or of your all encompassing sitting. What is this? Or just this? Henry gave a most uh, amazing, spontaneous Taisho Thursday night. He had prepared a talk and didn't feel he could give it on that occasion because uh, of neurology, neurological symptoms. He gets real dizzy and that triggers. And so right away he took us into a round of sitting. Best Taisho ever, he said. Just listen. There's a little bird chirping here outside the open window. What is this? Catch a glimpse and your heart may break all the way open. It may match the reality of your true heart. This is what Bodhidharma taught, wall gazing, gazing directly into the heart of the matter. Realizing gazing itself is the heart of the matter. Riveted in this practice realization, practicing realizing. This listening with no one doing anything. There's a famous four line stanza attributed to Bodhidharma, a pointer to what Zongsha and her Dharma brothers practiced and realized. We've heard it before. Here's one translation. A special transmission outside the scriptures, not depending on words or letters directly pointing to the mind. Seeing one's true nature and attaining Buddhahood. Awaken, that's all that is. Seeing one's true nature and waking up. Words can't touch it, but words are it. A more succinct version of this reads, point directly at the human mind, see its nature and become Buddha. Or another, to find a Buddha all you have to do is see your own nature. These are his teachings. In other words, be what you are, your true self. I've said this before, but I remember finding my way to Zen with such thirst and relief and being asked this question, you know, what brings you here? And what leapt out was, I want to be my true self. <laughs> I was absolutely without guile, un, you know, totally honest. I didn't know what, what I would say until it was said. 
But then, you know, later, well, how can you not be what you are? You can't. So welcome home. Bodhidharma taught, your nature is the Buddha and the Buddha is the person who is free. Free of plans, free of cares. Absolute freedom, wisdom. It's like not one thing to impede or impinge on anything. Nothing to hang on to, nothing to stick to, and no measure. Free of plans, free of cares. This Limitless freedom goes hand in hand with compassion. In the intimate dynamism of this, we, Thich Nhat Hanh said, we, we enter our, we're utterly interdependent, and at the same time, each one alone, complete. Each is all. Out of this, I call it empty dash infinite, you know, we search for words, this freedom, that there is anything at all is compassion. Whatever comes up, this sound, it's in. Just compassion. This is a little description of Zongshi from Sally Tisdale, who described her as a person of this great, great freedom, free of plans, free of cares. Tisdale writes, Zongshi became a person without boundaries. She ceased to think in terms of in and out, high and low. She ceased to think of the edges of herself and the edges of the world as being different things. One student who's deep into practice, experiencing this intimate interconnectedness of all things, along with a, a kind of newly forming sense of belonging. The student exclaimed, the floor needs me to walk on it. The birds need me to hear their song. The trees need me to see them. You know, to be a tree requires me. That was this effort to sort of express this intimacy. Another student recently recounted a fresh opening. He'd, he'd been ill for a month, so maybe um, sat up or something. And he described rolling over in bed in the night. And in that moment, just said, I lost all orientation. Fell in, out, up, down, no orientation. Then he moved to the cushion. And sitting, it happened again. He said, I lost all mooring, no up or down, lost consciousness, whatever this awareness, just gone. And then in a moment, back to upright sitting. 
that student then said, the only way to exist in that nothingness, how he put it, is to have a lot of love, a heart of love. Zen, he said, wants it all. It's not going to leave you with you. You've got to let go of everything. So here is the record of how Zongsha and her Dharma brothers expressed their realization. This is the record. One day Bodhidharma called together his disciples and said, the time has come for me to return part of a legend that he returned to India, but <coughs> more likely, and in this version, um, soon after this, he sits in Zazen upright and dies. The time has come for me to return. Each of you say something to demonstrate your understanding. Daofu said, his first disciple, my present view is, without being attached to the written word or being detached from the written word, one still engages in the function of the way. Bodhidharma said to Daofu, you have my skin. Then Zongsha said, it's like Ananda seeing the pure land, seen once, it isn't seen again. Or in another rendering, it's like seeing paradise once and never again. Bodhidharma said to her, you have my flesh. The third disciple, Dayu, said, the four elements are originally empty. The five aggregates are non-existent. There is not a single dharma to attain. Bodhidharma said, you have my bones. And then came Wika, Eka. Disciple, the first disciple who is said to have stood outside Bodhidharma's cave all night in heavy snow. And when Bodhidharma didn't turn to Wiki, he finally pulls out that little knife they carried and cuts off part of his arm, throws it into Bodhidharma. And Bodhidharma turns to him. So here now at the end of what would have been seven, eight, maybe nine years together, Huika, to demonstrate or present his understanding, he makes three deep bows and stands still. Bodhidharma said, of Wika. You have my marrow. This record ends, Wika or Eka was given transmission and became the second Chinese ancestor. So we don't have a record of Zongsha's teaching, but there is this Beautiful, not too long, fascicle uh, by Dogen, a chapter on this exchange in Dogen's Shobogenza, or Eye of the Treasury of the True Dog. The chapter is called Twining Vines, or in some translations, Entwining Vines. Early in the essay, Dogen writes, 
Bodhidharma once studied with Venerable Prajnatara. By the way, there's a lot of evidence that Prajnatara could well have been a woman, the 27th ancestor preceding Bodhidharma. So Dogen says, Bodhidharma once studied with Venerable Prajnatara and through realization directly received the admonitions of the Buddha, the bones of the way. In realization, he attained the source through the source and made it the root of branches and leaves. Then Dogen goes on to just let bloom the phrase entangling vines or twining vines. Tradition links this phrase with the entanglements of our lives, our stories, our constructs, delusions, our greed, anger, or ignorance. There's a early sutra, the Jata Sutra, that addresses the Buddha with a verse and a question. The Jata Sutra translates the tangle. And there's a Brahmin there who you know, greets the Buddha and steps to the side and asks this question by quoting a verse. Here it is. A tangle within, a tangle without. People are entangled within a tangle. Gotama, I ask you this, who can untangle this tangle? And the Buddha says, a person established in integrity, developing discernment in mind, ardent and clear, they can untangle this tangle. And then it goes on. Those whose passions, aversions, and ignorance have faded away, for them the tangle is untangled. And finally, where name and form, along with perception of impingement and form, totally stop without a trace. That's where the tangle is cut. Early teaching of the Buddha according to the sutras, the canon. One way of describing the practice of Zen, the tasks, so to speak, on the cushion. A little uncomfortable saying that because I really love the invitation to sit and do as little as possible. But somehow in doing that, what does happen are these entanglements get cut through or seen through. They, they start to dissolve, we let go, they fall away. You see, there's nothing really there. There's nothing binding me. Entangling Vines is also the title of a koan collection we don't, we don't take it up in a formal way, but um, somebody told me recently that David Hinton describes koans as Chan's demolition team. <laughs> so true to Doga, he takes up the entanglements that we experience as binding us the strictures and limitations we think we need to get rid of. And he just turns it around. And he does this in the context of transmission. The intimate eye-to-eye -eye realization of one body. This true human body. For Dogen, which he receives and passes on from his beloved teacher, Rujing, twining vines are it. That 
that's it, there's the Dharma. But, Dogen writes, those who notice this are rare, are entanglements. Nothing but the Dharma, nothing but oh, the intimate Dharma. You cannot fall out of it. Those thoughts that distract you, those judgments that situate us in a certain way, certain place and the world, situate the world in relation to you, twining minds, intimately interconnected, intimacy itself. When his four disciples present their views, each one of the Dharma, Bodhidharma responds to each in turn. You have my skin, you have my flesh, you have my bones, you have my marrow. For some translations, you have attained my skin, flesh, bones, marrow. Mika is Bodhidharma's first Dharma heir. But Dogen says, don't imagine that marrow is closer than skin, flesh, or bone. It's one body. And each is all of it. Dogen writes, investigate these words of Bodhidharma. You have attained my skin, flesh, bones, marrow. These are the ancestors' words. All four students had attainment and understanding. Each one's attainment and understanding is skin, flesh, bones, and marrow leaping out of body and mind. Skin, flesh, bones, and marrow dropping away body and mind. He goes on, to attain skin is to attain bones, flesh, and marrow. To attain bones, flesh, and marrow is to attain skin, flesh, and face. It is to understand not only that all the worlds of the 10 directions are the entire body, but that they are skin, flesh, bones, and marrow. In this way, writes Dogen, you attain my robe and you attain the dark. Dogen is so clear. It's not that the marrow is close and the skin is far. One body. He could have transmitted the Dharma seal to any one of them, to all of them. And he may have done. That's the assumption. So what about Zongsha's way of expressing her attainment, her experience of the Dharma? It is like the joy of seeing the pure land of seeing this joyous Buddha's paradise just once and not again. Or another one, joyfully. It's like seeing the land of awakening just once and not again. Land of awakening might make us think it's some you know, place you go to. No. See it once, and it's unspeakable grace. See it once, and something is settled. See it once, who you truly are, your original face. And it can 
only be now. Nowhere but here. The Buddha of pure joy. There's a, you know, according to Buddhist cosmology, you see this pure land just once and you'll never again be reborn into the wheel of samsara, these lower realms. But there's something so much more going on here than esoteric cosmology. Victoria Austin has a short chapter in that wonderful book, The Hidden Lamp, about Zongshu's transmission experience. Austin asks, what is the paradise that comes just once and not again? Why would Bodhidharma refer to it as flesh? What's important about flesh to Bodhidharma? Austin goes on, at that time, women were thought of as creatures of the flesh and a woman's flesh was thought of as tainted. Women had to be reborn in the body of a man in order to awaken. This was the common understanding of the culture. But Bodhidharma didn't say, you have a woman's flesh and have to be reborn. He said, you have my flesh. Bodhidharma has a teaching. The Buddha is your real body, your original mind. This mind has no form, no characteristics, no cause, no effect, no tendons and no bones. It's like space. You can't hold it, except for one who's fully realized. No one, no mortal, no deluded being can fathom it. That's a quote from one of Bodhidharma's sermons. Then Dogen writes, you have my flesh. Is this very body? Since that, you have my flesh. That's it. And yet there is this bodiliness. It, it can't be fathomed beyond explanation, before knowing but we can rejoice in it. <laughs> and we could explore and discover what is this for ourselves? This Buddha nature or awakened nature, it's not something you have. the entire body, the whole body, is awakened Buddha nature. This fathom long body and this body and this body and this body. the little gnat flying around the room, the sounds outside. A hundred percent. Austin ends her essence on Zongsha with a question. Can, she writes, can we ever see paradise for more than a moment? And if not, is a moment enough? Zongshu was clear, once and not again, joyfully, inexhaustibly, enough. I don't think she was pointing to some past experience. 
this world of awakening. Here. There's a sense that comes up often, I think, in this practice. I just, I hear it from others and I've experienced it, you know, this, this sense that if my whole life consists of only this moment, it is complete. To realize this, is to realize the whole life. That it is a joy. Rather unconditionally free. A tangle within, a tangle without. People are entangled within a tangle we see this as a problem, something to fix or escape or undo. On the surface, it can be constraining as if there's something hindering or blocking our view. Where is the wide open lens of the Dharma where nothing is excluded? It's right here. So it makes it possible with Dogen and Rujin to realize our great entanglement with all the ancestors and without adding anything extra to see that twining vines, that's nothing but the Dharma. See it once. And you may find yourself in paradise, just as you are. Thank you. Thank you so much for this shared practice. For each of us, for all of us, and for this whole wide world, this true human body.